Hi, everybody. Alan, say hello. Hello. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, we've got people live in person and on YouTube, so we'll really we'll kick off any questions. Um, and for people listening online too, we'll repeat any questions uh, and we'll have someone else reading out the questions as well for those that are online, because obviously we can't see from over here. So has anyone got any questions on the floor to sort of start and begin with? I just first say, actually, okay. thank you for creating this, because this is the first time we've done this. And it means a lot for me, for the foundation and the people in my community. I think everyone just want to say a big thank you to you because it's it's amazing what you've done and yeah i'm, I'm getting emotional mm. i mean when i listen to this it's as i said last night i listened to the game last night and it's like it's brilliant it was so so special so thank you so much yeah. thank you for all the support and all, all the shares that have happened people watching online down there are people all over the country and around the world that are tuning in so Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'm happy to answer any question of the documentary or the foundation, the future of the foundation, any challenges of the documentary. We're, we're completely open to, to anything at all. Go on, Tim. Uh, firstly, well done on the uh, documentary. Really enjoyed it. Fascinating to into that. Um, I, I suppose there was a few things that came out of it. One, the, the Scandinavian connection. Did, did you discover why I got to Frank? Scandinavia, uh, how long you stayed there, you know, why you came back, uh, and then what happened in those intervening times uh, when he came back. Is, is it, I didn't realize it's difficult to unpick it all, but it's quite intriguing you went there. You, you can't. I was going to yeah. say just quickly, so the question was um, about Scandinavia and why did Frank go to Scandinavia, and then what happened about him coming back? I think there's still a lot of research we don't know about. There's still a lot of gaps in our knowledge of when he was there and what he did there um, because back then the um, it was all very amateur the football day was very amateur so they didn't really log all this information and it's i think this is very hard for for myself and for other people doing research because we, we don't speak Swedish or know any of the Norwegian. So there's probably a load of uh, material still out there which we don't know about yet. Um, why he went there, I think we, over the years for me, finding out more about him, I felt maybe he was trying to get away from something, getting away from someone uh, or something, or, or maybe finding somewhere where he had an easier way into football, into coaching. Because possibly, I mean, I don't know. We we haven't we don't have first time. Uh, we we, have, we haven't asked him personally in the sense that why'd you go? But I think there probably was more opportunities for him over there as opposed to over here. Where I think even nowadays, I feel coaches from a ethnic background might have more problems getting into football. So I mean, there's problems now. I can't imagine how it was back then. Yeah. So. That, that must... yeah, he, he was very unique when we spoke to the when we spoke to Hassa and the people out in Sweden and um, he was actually one of the only Chinese people that they knew so so I really, really like like Susan said and um, in England in the same way it was it was sort of a bit of a novelty people couldn't really believe that there, there was someone that was involved in football from a different background and I think we really noticed as well speaking to people in Sweden and the few people that did know him and know of him that certainly his time in Scandinavia and in Europe generally, it might not have been as cheery as, as we think. Like, like we said in a documentary here, it was very positive and something changed. And whatever that reason was, the truth is we probably won't ever have reasons because of the time period and the fact that articles and you know, archive has been lost um, and first hand accounts don't exist anymore. So that's a real challenge. And so actually you have to try and piece a huge jigsaw together with very, very few pieces. And that's quite hard to do. So but I yeah. think there is around that sort of time on a personal side for him, he did lose his wife at that sort of time so maybe that comes into it um so we haven't really gone into depth into that because i don't know if that's the place that we should be going into but i mean i think that maybe helps answer that question in some way yeah. yes then yeah look, just to follow up a question on the back of that you mentioned susan and she mentioned the fact that frank was perhaps perceived to be something of novelty do you think if frank sue was playing today would he still be perceived as a novelty 
I'll just repeat that. <laughs> yeah, so of course, sorry, I'm, I'm wrong. Um, the question was about Frank Sue and if he was playing today in the 21st century, would he still be a novelty like he was last century? Um, I think there's more acceptance now that football is such an international sport. So it wouldn't be a novelty in the sense that I've never seen a Chinese person before. Um, but then I think there is a part of it where it is sort of, even though in my experience there has been other people from East and South East Asian backgrounds playing football, it's not prominent now. You don't really see that nowadays. So yeah, I guess there will be that sort of tag on novelty in a sense. But then football so international now that you wouldn't think, oh, someone from different country coming in here play is something that different. So I think something that we discussed a lot while making a documentary in that process was actually the influence that Frank would have had if the media had existed. And I think the the difference in opinion and the difference in say popularity of East and Southeast Asian players in sport now would be a completely different story. And I think that had a massive impact him playing at the time that it did. And sadly actually a very negative impact because actually looking 50 years back there was only newspapers unfortunately like we found in our in research and even in scandinavia too with some of the people that we spoke to a lot of it was negative and lots of it wasn't deemed in a, in a positive light and i think actually that if he was playing now he would be a trailblazer um, and actually but hopefully through this documentary and do things that alan's doing through the foundation and the work that other people are doing that trailblazers for ethnic minorities in sports can really come to life and, and really start to take um, to, to, to make take make a change, to take a stance. I think it's so important. Yeah, thank you. Just one more question, Trevor. I just spoke with again something Susan Gardner said. I think she said that she was optimistic that Frank would have got called up to play for England, and, and you know, had there been a war, had there not been a war. What do you both think about that? Because Jack Leslie in the 1925 was called up for the England squad, but then that call up was withdrawn, and that wasn't. That many years earlier, so yeah. do you feel a lot had changed? Do you agree with Susan? What's your take? Well, you can, you can go, Charlie. Yeah, yeah, so well, we're going to say the question was if. If the war hadn't broke out, would Frank have been called up to England? Uh, and our personal opinions on the uh, on, on the matter. I think you bring up Jack Leslie, and that was about ten years previous, and then you add on the next person of color to be called up for England was Viv Anderson in the seventies. It's quite a big gap. So, I mean, I'm not going to. You can make up your own mind there why there's such a big gap. So, yeah, yeah. I think that's that is definitely telling, isn't it? But the one thing that I would say to not necessarily contradict, but to add to that in a, in a different way is that when you talk to Stoke fans, you know, in the modern day, not many people know of Frank Sue, and there are people that you can speak to all over the world that are football fans, but Stoke fans have a, have a real love, and I'm sure any Stoke fans listening would say the same, they have a real love for Frank Sue and really appreciate who he was. And I actually think that if, I actually think if the war hadn't broken out, I, I think he would have. And like Susan says, um, unfortunately, when he was due to be called up, he had an injury. And, and that, was, that was one of those really unfortunate things. I do believe that the way his career was going with Stoke and how popular he was becoming, he was a household name. You know, people knew who Frank Sue was, uh, and he was uh, he was really setting. I think he was starting to tear up the football scene back in the, back in the thirties. And so, unfortunately, it just happened that the war broke out, and then things went the way they did. I think that's one of the questions that we probably can't answer mm. because we there's not like a secret dossier somewhere saying that. <laughs> right. So it's very hard for us to answer because there's no real evidence of even way really. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'd love to think that he would have, because that would have been amazing. Uh, but yeah, yeah. I don't think we can answer that question. No. Any other questions, please? Yes. If Frank had a English father and a Chinese mother, so the other way around to his current heritage, would there have been a different outcome for him playing football? Alan, you've had time in the world to think. Hundred percent, hundred percent. I think the name makes a big difference. I've been talking to, I mean, even the family, even Jackie, the Frank's uh, granny, uh, the Norway president. She even said that in her own experience, trying to get a job when she put her name as Jackie Sue. No interviews. Change to Jackie Smith. Fine. So. Name, I think it makes a massive difference. 
Um, and the same as your, your, your question about um, if it was purely Chinese or purely or a mix. I think when you look at the players who come through, a lot of the players from the Chinese heritage have mixed heritage. But for me, that doesn't really take away from the fact that they do have that heritage, that they would have that connection with people from the East Asian um, community, because that's really important too. Um, so I think it makes a huge difference, and I think it's and it happens now. It, ha it still happens now. Telling us how, because his surname is Lot, which is not the typical Asian like Lao or Chan, he he still has a slightly easier way of getting into to mm. the industry. So I think that makes a big difference. Yeah. Is that all right? I mean, yeah, 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 long, yeah. <laughs> long well, now, now there's obviously no questions online. So any, any other questions on the floor would be great. Yes. What is your favourite story that you came across that you weren't able to put into your... That's really hard. That's one of the things about this documentary that's difficult that I, I'll say on, yeah, on camera as well, that I only had 30 minutes to make this documentary, that was my time limit, and I had over two hours worth of interview um, in story alone, you know, and, and that, was, that was really hard. Ronnie had some great stories about Frank that I couldn't include, um, and he told one about a football but he had a football when he was a kid from the, from the signed England team with so Stanley Matthews and all this stuff. And he, you know, eight or however old he was as a child, he kicked it around the garden and got it all muddy and torn up. And you imagine how much that would be worth now. And he was given that, you know, how many years later. And there's that, that sort of story. Yeah, the other thing we could mention on, um, on, on our live stream as well that, that was really great is when we were in Sweden, we actually went to one of the clubs that Frank managed, which would be the equivalent of a non league team uh, in England now. So effectively, a club that's not necessarily well known. We travelled quite a way out for it, and at the time it was freezing cold. I was wearing um, a hat, and this guy that was walking past us sort of pointed at me and said, "Oh, you're wearing and so wearing a Liverpool hat." He said, "Wearing a Liverpool hat," and he had a Bradford mixed Swedish accent. It's really interesting blend. There's a bit of Scouts in there too. Anyway, we got talking to him, and he was a ball boy when, or and he was involved in the dressing room. He went in to do something. I'm not sure much about it. He was. He was. No, he was a player. He was. He he wasn't academy, but he yes. was doing something else as well because he was at. Anyway, the, the story goes that he walked into a, a dressing room at sort of 12, 13 years old, and Bill Shankly went in, was in there with the leading goal scorer at the time, who is it was it was absolute like you know heroes, and it was that sort of thing where in a random pitch in Sweden in Stockholm we were walking along and a guy saw a little this guy saw my Liverpool hat and we had a full conversation. It's things like that where it really realise it makes you realise that you know hopefully this documentary and, and go, football generally unites people and, and it's a thing of unity and it's a thing that brings people together and that's a story that I'll never forget being it's freezing cold in Sweden and this guy all of a sudden said oh I've been to Liverpool and I you know amazing so, any other questions yes um, I don't know enough about how much how much football I get pay, paid in those days mm -hmm. could it be a, um, a re the reason that he actually moved to Sweden if they pay more oh the other way around definitely the other way around the other way around, yeah, definitely yeah, the other way around. Because, because it was so amateur there, yeah. it wouldn't, yeah, it wouldn't affect it, would it? Yeah, that's why, that's why in Sweden, you know, for, for Hassa and his brother Stickham, they, they played two sports because actually playing football, it, it wasn't sufficient all year round, it didn't, it didn't have enough money, and, and that certainly has a big impact. And I think that actually had an impact on, on probably Frank's managerial career too, because like I said in the documentary, yeah. Lots of the leagues were amateur. You know, they weren't viewed as they weren't viewed as top professional sports. Mm. It was like football was sort of seen as a as a side hobby, um, which was quite funny. Obviously, when Frank makes this joke about ice hockey as well, saying, "You know, why are you playing this ridiculous game of ice hockey when you should be focusing on football?" Um, and in the end, obviously, came round to it. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Do you want to talk about Yeah, that was quite a random one. Um, <laughs> so, I 
Travel Walk with Claire. Um, I'm doing all the work with walkers. And uh, one of the first people that I work with quite closely is um, Dave Messenger. Uh, I've been with him doing the lead at BMI at Watford. And he knew someone <laughs> uh, who works at Yield Gardens. Who then she knew someone <laughs> who knew someone. <laughs> and then that's, yeah, it sort of came through for that. I think in, in football, in my experience, I haven't been working in football for that long, but you find these people and you, you talk to someone and you don't know someone, you know someone, and it all sort of comes together. And, and it's a small, small world. Yeah. The other thing that was quite fun about that story, too, so I and um, both Richard Hallam arrived on the Thursday to Sweden. I arrived on the Friday. My plane was delayed by sort of 30, 45 minutes. So actually, literally, I touched down in Sweden. I got the train from the, the Arlanda, which is the main airport in Stockholm, and straight into effectively Grand Central Station. I was greeted in a car to go straight to Hass's house. And we were welcomed in like it was family. It was a really, actually a really moving experience because we were having these conversations translated through either Pella, sort of translator, or another man who was there. Um, and we would talk to us and we could gauge what he was saying. You know, you, you can understand when someone's angry or if they're upset or whatever. And, but there were moments where he, he'd like, someone would walk out the room and he'd start telling us things and we had no idea what he was saying. He was so emotive yeah. and he was talking about Frank and he'd get all like excited and, and, and spurred up. Um, and we didn't know what he was saying. I think we'll wrap up. Well, thank you so much everyone for coming. Thank you everyone for watching as well online, those that did. Um, I'll, I'll clip this together so it all works. But yes, thank you so much. Really appreciate all the support. <laughs>